Uh, just in this closure, this sum, um, I'm CEO of a very tricky 50% effort, but there's other companies that have just uh, moved from children's national to the uh, Also, I think everybody recognizes that anything we're talking about, of course, you should um, uh, talk to your physician. This is really just a uh, research and information purposes only. So the goal of the Moral Program was to um, just acknowledge that uh, corticosteroids, like the place of prednisone, work well on the end. Um, mechanisms of action may be anti-inflammatory, uh, but they're complicated. They remain standard of care for hundreds of conditions since the 1950s, fast as no health buys ever awarded. Uh, but then, as, as was also mentioned last talk, there's a lot of side effects. Uh, so the Department of Defense, one of the first programs I mentioned, had, um, Annie mentioned earlier, the Department of Defense began funding this. They did a wide group of work with working in channels of dystrophy, and that led to this project of really trying to peel away the complicated nature of the corticoids or corticosteroids, have many different activities, can we understand what the good layers are going to do that? And so throughout this talk, I'll talk about efficacy and safety. So efficacy is what helps a uh, Duchenne boy, and safety is what adds to the side effect of the levels. So uh, John McCall was, this was his idea, he's a chemist, he works with a lot of groups in the Duchenne field and others. Um, and then you see the structures of prednisone, dexamethasone, and place reports relatively similar. Um, this is a, the main difference of the drug I'll show you here is where those blue arrows are. And there was one drug brought to market for spinal cord injury and head trauma called Terilizad, and that was John McCall's program some 20 years ago. So we revisited this uh, uh, drug as a membrane stabilizer, thinking of counteract uh, dystrophin deficiency of the plasma membrane. So it in fact does counteract um, dystrophin deficiency over is this a cell? Um, over to the right, uh, prednisone actually makes sort of worse use of membrane stability of uh, dysfunction efficient muscle cells where a uh, more alone improves it, more alone being the same. But then we went and we looked at the anti-inflammatory activity, and there you see on the left that really tracks directly with the corticosteroids. So the uh, more alone is as anti-inflammatory as other corticosteroids. Um, So what are the, I'm just going to skip, I'm not going to show much data, much of it's published now, but what are the different sort of layers of the corticosteroid onion? So the key efficacy words I mentioned is anti-inflammatory, that's thought to be through what's called m kappa b which is your main danger signal, so anytime you have any sort of injury to any cell, it starts turning on these danger signals, and um, what all corticosteroids seem to do is suppress them, so the moral retains this, a known safety issue is interaction with hundreds of genes and turning them on. So the um, corticosteroids, um, prednisone, inflation, or others, interact with the receptor, they go into the cell nucleus throughout the body, all the cells, and turn on lots of genes. Uh, that turns out to be mostly side effects, and what we've shown is that the moral reduces that about 100 fold. Then we have two novel efficacy aspects. One I mentioned is this membrane stabilizing effect, and so that's new to the moral argument. And then, more recently, we've sort of found out safety term efficacy. So, uh, prednisone and, and a lot of corticosteroids are known to interact with a different receptor called the mineral corticoid receptor, which controls your salt balance on your kidneys, so whether your urinary output. And it, corticosteroids are an agonist, they turn on that system, and that seems to contribute to the weight gain and cushion line features. For more alone, we've turned into an antagonist, so the opposite turns that system off. And so another drug that's now popular in particularly older Duchenne patients is, is uh, Plarinone. And the Plarinone is also an antagonist of the neural cortical receptor because it improves heart function. So we've now sort of turned the, the more alone into a form of the Plarinone. Uh, so how does it show uh, work in the MDS mouse? So, uh, Corticosteroid stunt growth can cause bone secondary problems. That's one of the mo more clinically relevant side effects because, as you know, it cause uh, fragile bones and uh, problems in healing those bones. And so, prednisone does that to a mouse as well, but the hormone doesn't. Uh, with prednisone, you, with strength, you end up with a small, strong mouse, uh, with more long, you end up with a large, strong mouse. So, there's always been a question whether the stunting of growth you see with corticosteroids is one of the reasons they work because the kids are smaller. Well, this suggests that that might not be true. You can retain size and still improve strength. Um, so then we've developed this drug. Um, uh, 
Um, this is looking at the real corticoid receptor uh, and showing that you improve the heart function, so in mice as well. And, um, so again, seeing that a clarinone like activity. There we go. Um, so in summary, efficacy would retain transrepression and thin kappa B. We can increase the dose, presumably, and I'll show you the phase one data because uh, we don't have, seem to have the side effects. We've gained this membrane stabilization, which should counteract restricted deficiency somewhat. Um, we've improved safety because of this loss of transactivation, and we've turned safety, turned efficacy with this MI antagonism, so loss of growth stunting, uh, gain of heart efficacy. So then the, this has now been taken through clinical trials. We started in only to show children this month uh, under a venture philanthropy model. Uh, venture philanthropy has many different uh, names, but simply put, it's um, fiduciary duty to stakeholders and not so much the money or stockholders. So this entire program is going to be supported by you guys, by the Parent Project, the Western Industry Association, governments, um, without any stockholders or venture capitalists involved. One of the key organizations was the NIH and CATS Therapeutics for Rare Disease, where they would keep many of the different tests to make sure that they, so if you're going to fail, fail early instead of later in larger clinical trials. Treatment and TAC reviewed this, lots of grant applications. So, so far, um, there's been 24 million to date raised through a lot of your efforts and our efforts in government efforts, including the European Union. Uh, and the FDA and EMA were really great as far as multiple rounds of. Of guidance. So I'll just spend the remaining slides on the clinical program. So we finished uh, phase one trials with about 80 healthy adults. The major goals of the phase one study are to we'll see how the drugs metabolize. We saw that with the PK studies and pharmacodynamics in the, in, for the flaze report. Now we can't test efficacy in adult volunteers because they're helpful. Um, so we can't see if the uh, counteracts muscular dystrophy, but we can test safety. And so this next couple of slides now looks at these issues of adrenal suppression, bone turnover, et cetera, in healthy volunteers. And we do that using biomarkers. And so that's kind of the theme of the remainder of the slides. A biomarker is when you take a blood sample, and it really gives you a snapshot of whether the drug's acting, it's sort of acute objective readout of how the drug's working. Hopefully before you have you look at clinical symptoms, maybe months or even a year later. So these biomarkers, I'll, give, I'll show you some data, but from the very first dose of prednisone and flexicord in a child, within hours, many of these biomarkers change, that are safety biomarkers. So they change the bone turnover, they change adrenal suppression, et cetera. So that's what I'll show you here. So the key ones, the four, are adrenal suppression. Adrenal suppression is, you have these diurnal cycles of cortisol. Cortisol is pretty much similar to the other drugs, like corticosteroids, I kind of sound like it work. And this wakes you up in the morning and it falls by lunch. Now if you give a drug, um, it shuts down the adrenals making those steroid hormones. So that's called adrenal suppression. So where most of your steroid hormones come from is now uh, shut down by the drug. And that causes these, some of these downstream side effects. It also puts a risk for adrenal crisis. Adrenal crisis is when you have uh, surgery or acute illness, or trauma, um, traumatic injury. Your body needs to make that stress hormone, which is cortisol. It's the same hormone. And so it spikes normally, it spikes that way up to help protect you against surgery and damage. Um, and it's a way of all organisms protecting themselves. Well, these corticosteroids suppress the adrenals, so they often make it hard, if not impossible, to mount that stress response. And so that's what's called an adrenal crisis. It's not frequent, but it's something that usually a lot of patients have morning parts look after that. Then there's insulin resistance that um, changes the insulin and glucose metabolism, so your body really can't get glucose, sugar into the muscle. A bone turnover, the bone fragility and stunting of growth, and then immune suppression over on top of so there's a great paper out of uh, a drug company a couple of years ago that looked at prednisone in terms of all this, and we just benchmarked against those. For adrenal suppression, I just mentioned that side effects include diagnosis of weight cycles, growth stunting, employee puberty, and a risk of an adrenal crisis. So, there we go. Um, here's an example of your shin kids. Um, many of you, some of you may have participated in this, this is part of Craig McDonald's. Uh, Duchenne Natural History Study. If we just look at kids on steroids and not on steroids, corticosteroids, prednisone or nephrosin, 
what you see is normal kids have these steroid hormone levels off to the left, and you can see all the steroid hormones drop. So testosterone, progesterone, and that's the same with the time with bowel disease. It's the same with anybody taking corticoids, which is suppressing the adrenal function. So when we look at the uh, femoral arm, what we see is you really don't see that until very high doses. You have to go about 100 times prednisone dose before you start seeing the adrenal suppression. So by the time we get to 20 minutes per day, per day, we're starting to see it. About half the patients after a day are normal volunteers, and almost everybody, well, everybody after two weeks of treatment. But that's 30 times prednisone dose, and so that's higher than we're planning to go in the, the Duchenne trials. Um, and the bone turnover, as I mentioned, is particularly important. And you see in the, on the left there, with prednisone, within hours of a single dose of prednisone in adult volunteers, you're changing the bone metabolism. So you're basically heading the bone towards what's called osteopenia, where it's weaker bones. And there on the right is the moral arm data. We see no evidence of change of any of the, the, the uh, biomarkers. Well, so far we've checked uh, CTX, which is a marker of uh, bone resorption and osteocalcin, which is uh, formation and neither change. Um, insulin resistance is where your muscles uh, can't get sugar energy from your blood, and that glucocorticoids are well known to cause that. Again, to the left there, within hours of one dose, it's changed insulin resistance, and then you would take a uh, corticosteroids. And off to the right there, the normal doesn't show any evidence of that any dose, even 30 times prednisone dose. So in summary, the phase one data, K is a well-behaved drug, short half-life similar to the cortical steroids, food effect, um, liver is a primary target organ, but we really only saw one patient had a whole dosing and get our pre-existing um, uh, elevations of liver enzymes. Um, Pharmacodynamic biomarkers are all consistent with the mouse data and the vitro data, so the human data looks very similar to what we have in place. So now I'll just to finish off with the DMD clinical program. We're, the initial trials are focusing on four to seven year old steroid pregnant boys. A lot of this is because we have to see the difference in benchmark for prednisone, so the boys can't be already treated with prednisone. We won't be able to see the sort of force from the trees there. The two A's in the US is in eight synergy sites. Um, the US is multiple center dose, two week acute safety by um, tolerability, PK, four dose groups going from 0.25 to 6 mix per kg, and we started rolling this week. Um, phase 2 extension, those patients that have the uh, option of enrolling to a six month open label study, and there we're looking at these biomarkers, making sure the different doses, we can monitor safety, and I'll come to efficacy biomarkers in a second. The 2B is being funded by the European Union, um, uh, along with Newcastle University, to Kate Bushmeter and her team. That's blind and randomized placebo prednisone control for arms in Europe. But we did have a, a, a frantic thing last week with Brixel? Brixel? Oh, yeah. Brixel. 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 That's it. Because this was a big European Union grant to the United Kingdom, to Newcastle, funding this trial. And we're wondering if Brexit just uh, crashed the trial. But we don't think it does. So, uh, and that should begin rolling about a year from now. Uh, so, how do we measure clinical efficacy? One of the advantages of this model is all driven by academics. So, we're, we tend to be um, quite not risk averse, so risk tolerant. And we're trying to do things like outcome measures research and biomarkers research that will benefit all drug programs and hopefully facilitate those. So, one key thing is to move away from the six minute block. Uh, as we are benchmarking a corticosteroid, what time functions tests uh, will work for this? And again, working with Craig McDonald and the Natural History Study. So we looked at lots of the steroid effect, and much of this is similar to the data that you just saw with the phasing work. But here over to the right is how many patients you need to see a corticosteroid effect uh, at 3 months, 6 months, or 12 months. And you only need a handful of subjects. That's very consistent with what you just saw. They really do work. You see time to run improving, time to come stairs improving, time to stand improving. So we needed to pick one of those for our primary outcomes. So we went back to the parents and asked, what's most relevant to your quality of life? And there was quite a consensus for time to stand. I think the imagery is falling down on the street or someplace and other people stand at school. And that's, um, so that's what we chose as our primary outcome measure. And that's already been through EMA and FDA and have agreed with use of that as a primary outcome measure. 
uh, for critical safety, um, we, we all know about the deceleration of growth, so the growth stunting, and that's a critical concern. And we can see that over 12 months after the break there. You see the growth slowing down, and Chen kids here with corticosteroids. But the, the key thing is look at the error bars. So there's this big variation between kids, which means some kids just grow slow and some kids grow fast. And to see the drug effect is hard because there's so much variability. Whereas if you look at change in body mass index to the left, kids are much more consistent in their weight and over as a function of time. And the drug really increases, or the steroids increase the weight considerably. So if you do a size calculation there, you need about three kids to see the weight gain of pregnancy. And there would be more, many more kids to see that change in the place part because they have less of a weight gain issue. So that becomes our primary safety outcome. So our clinical efficacy time to stand is primary efficacy, change of BMI is primary safety, and then multiple secondary outcomes. And the last few slides I'm going to talk about biomarkers, because I think this is going to be a way of the future, particularly when we want to talk about combinations of drugs in Duchenne kids and some uh, other existing already approved drugs that might work in Duchenne, how do we see that on top of on all these different combinations? And so I think biomarkers are a way to, to look at that. So just the last few slides, we show, I already showed you that blood biomarkers are predictive of later safety concerns. So adrenal suppression, insulin resistance, bone um, turnover. So we can measure that within five hours and that, of the first dose. And that predicts how that, that boy's bones are going to be in years down the street. Um, and for each of these biomarkers. So those are safety. But we really like the similar markers for efficacy. That if we, after even one dose, we could then predict how that, how that kid would get stronger um, months or years down the street. And this could argue against the placebo effect if an open label trial could aid in dose selection, finding the minimal efficacious dose of limited numbers of subjects, it could enable drug development in ages where there are no clinical applications for efficacy. You've heard that there's a lot of effort of PPMD on neonatal screening. But if we need to move some of these drugs to neonates and we can screen them and find some of these kids at birth, but how do you know if the drug's working or not? There's really no it's obviously not a six minute walk test for a year. So you need things like biomarkers to try to do that. So we have two publications coming out. One in, um, I think Craig McDonald and Synergy Network, Entry Papal is the, the lead PI in that. Um, and also one in Climate Bowel Disease, Pediatric, looking at corticosteroid markers. And so um, this just gives you an example of potential efficacy markers. So you see these are two different groups of Duchenne kids, one to the left, one to the right, and the same marker, three markers in a row. When you see, you look at normal kids, they have this serum protein at a certain level. Look at Duchenne kids, it's much higher, and it's a pro-inflammatory protein. Same, the muscle is upset, it's inflammatory. You give them corticosteroids, that drops back down to normal. So this is the type of efficacy biomarker you'd like to find. So then now, even with, potentially within just an hour or so of the first dose, we can see if the drug is suppressing the these, these signature of a pro-inflammatory state, and that's why the clinical protocols are working. So we have a series of those. Those are all integrated into the clinical trial program, both with EMA and F FDA. So summary of pharmacodynamic biomarkers, we have secondary outcomes as bridge safety markers for adrenal suppression, uh, bone insulin resistance, bone turnover, and immune suppression, both acute and chronic, and then we have this bank of exploratory outcomes, which are non bridge safety and efficacy markers, and those papers are coming out. So the last slide is just um, where we stand in timing. So these are the uh, eight synergy sites in the US that are beginning to enroll. Uh, the contact is there, you have it a page in your, your book, and uh, Andrea Smith is the contact there, and also clinical trials that I go from Duchenne uh, Connect. So um, over the next six months, we'll move to in the US, and then we we'll move over about a year from now to the European larger blind trial. So acknowledgments, uh, John McCall and Kevin Green and Raj, who are key originators from the Rear Gym, along with myself, Jesse Damsker at Korea, who are helping team up, and we just, uh, at PPMD's suggestion, have a new employee, Suzanne Gaglioni, um, dead name, no, I got a weapon in name. Uh, who is helping with the travel arrangements for uh, patients to the trials. The biomarkers group is listed there. I mentioned them already. Uh, phase 2A trials led by Paul Clemens in Pittsburgh, and the Phase 2B trial by Michelle Miller and Kate Bushby in Newcastle. And then lastly, uh, funding. 
is uh, a lot, as I mentioned, this is all under a venture funding model, so lots of foundations, including Parent Project, give a really critical grant to do the, the long term uh, animal toxicity studies, which are very expensive, along with uh, Foundation Dramatic and Duchenne, and all these government organizations. Thank you.